The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. James Dubrow, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, James, let's start. Let's let's find out about you. Um, how did how did you get into writing these books? First of all, like where where did that come from? Uh, it's a long story, but I'll do it short. Um, I got into crime, my life in crime, in a PhD at the University of Toronto in 18th century English literature, which sounds a long way from crime, but it isn't. If you know anything about 18th century literature, we had a lot, you know, fielding. Jonathan Wilde, the thief taker general, a lot going on. But at any rate, I uh, suddenly got a lectureship canceled, so I needed to get some work. And a friend of mine was a producer at the CBC. So I got a job as a researcher on a documentary, uh, television documentary, and they asked me for subjects. And I said, having come from the United States to do my PhD, I said, well, the CIA is everywhere. Let's do a thing about the CIA. Now, this is in early 73, right? And uh, they said, oh, well, that's pretty hard to do. And I said, no, nah, it should be all right. Anyway, we did we did a one-hour documentary on the CIA in Canada, spent a year doing it, and it was quite a sensational program uh, on Canadian television. We were attacked by Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of the current Prime Minister. We revealed the fact that there was a secret intelligence agency in the Canadian a science establishment, and we revealed all sorts of undercover operations and murders and God knows what, and uh, that Willie Brandt had been working for the CIA, a whole bunch of things that came out of that show. We got five stories in the paper the next day, including two in the New York Times. So from that, I, uh, they, the CBC wanted us to do a series of documentaries on organized crime. So I spent five years working on about eight and a half hours of documentaries on organized crime, the mafia, Asian gangs, uh, bikers, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, I started out by not believing that the mafia was terribly well organized or a conspiracy. I quickly changed after I read all the material and interviewed people like Bob Blakey and others who had listened to the wiretaps. And uh, from that, the books, you asked me about the books, they came out of the, uh, really all the films I did for the CBC. The fact that we had a few high profile godfathers killed here in Toronto in 1983. So I had to write a, I didn't have to, but I wrote a book about the one that we focused on, the ones we focused on in connections. It was called the TV series. And uh, Paul Volpe, who was a Canadian gangster who worked very closely with the mob in Philadelphia, Montreal. In Buffalo. So that book led to, and you know how these things go, that book led to another book about the mob going back into history in the 20s, about Rocco Perry, who worked with the Canadian, who worked with the Al Capone in the 20s and 30s, and his most incredible two wives, who they were these Jewish uh, gangster wives who really ran the mobs in the 20s here in Canada and the 30s. Fascinating women. Someday there'll be a TV series about them. And then I wrote a book on uh, a woman who uh, was a mistress to a lot of mafia people and would be loaned out to visiting American mafios when, when they came here for an evening. It's called Mob Mistress. And then the most difficult book was the one on Asian gangs. I started that, well, I started working on that in, in the early 80s. Didn't get the book finished for over 10, 10, 15 years, it's so mind complicated the names and the trying to cover all the research in China and Hong Kong and all over the world. But there were so many international gangs and had been operating for over 100 years in some cases that were trafficking in people, human beings, drugs. Um, and of course, most recently, uh, in fentanyl, um, and money laundering, hundreds of millions of dollars are being laundered in money. We'll get to that later. Um, right now in North America by these Chinese mobs that are directly tied in. This is the important thing. They're directly tied in with the Chinese government. It's the only way it can work in China. The only way it has ever worked in China, really. 
And so these triads are very closely working with the Chinese government. The, the Chinese government has so many levers that they can use in, in, in dealing with various countries in the world, and that's one of the most important ones. And they've really been behind the fentanyl epidemic, opioid epidemic in North America in the last 10, 15 years. And I think Trump has touched on that once or twice, but hasn't done that much about it. Uh, well, he's some got of his hands full. <laughs> he's got his hands full. That's, that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's busy. He's got, he's got the Bible in his hand, so he's ready. Ah, the um, Bible, right. Yeah. Did you ever worry about um, some sort of repercussion or some sort of... Um, uh, like when you're dealing with um, mobs and the Asian underworld and the Chinese government and you're writing about them and researching about them and, and um, they've got to know about you. So um, yeah. do, you, do you ever worry that um, something could happen to you or, you know, not well, just physically? But. Yeah, I, I've been careful, but, you know, you're right. I mean, obviously, a lot of times they did know about me. And in some cases, I mean, I've had my close calls. Uh, I remember I was almost shot once in China. I went in uh, over the border from Shenzhen, uh, from Hong Kong to Shenzhen with a friend of mine who was a triad. See, that, now, this is the funny thing. The triad people get quite along, get along quite well with the Chinese government people. So, anyway, he took me in. He was showing me the routes they were, they were moving people and drugs on the Chinese side when we got surrounded by People's Liberation Army with guns and all that. But we talked our way out of it. And there's often, you know, amazing how many things you can talk your way out of. You see that even now in the coverage of the excesses of some police and dealing with journalists. Most journalists can talk their way out of getting too roughed up by cops in the middle of a protest. And likewise, <laughs> <laughs> you know, likewise, I mean, I've had dinners with triad bosses in Hong Kong and Toronto and actually normally it was quite luxurious I mean no we had fabulous food no bill That's <laughs> little <even> presents <laughs> yeah little presents you know I mean they're trying to impress me because there are like everything else like the mafia and everything else are also to rival groups right so while we have triads it's not one group there's literally hundreds of triad groups and uh, many of them are fighting with each other they often work together too but so I was able to play Vietnamese gangs against uh, the triad gangs and uh, uh, the big circle boys which is one of the ones involved today these are the the gangsters from mainland China who came out of the uh, prison the people's liberation prisons after Mao in oh gosh it would have been back in the 60s and 70s uh, the big circle boys gangs operate all over North America Vancouver uh, Toronto uh, certainly in Singapore well not Singapore as much as uh, Hong Kong certainly China they're they're the number one people in methamphetamine um, money laundering I'd say hundreds of millions of dollars literally um, and the fentanyl trade. So the big circle boys have to be uh, organized crime gang. They're not one. They're not one gang though. There are many rival groups within. This is true of all gangs. You know, the Russian mafia. There's many Russian mobs, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. Many biker gangs. So none of these things are. You know, they don't control everything in their orbit. Mm. Um, you know, so that late, that executive that got arrested, um, the Huawei, um, oh yeah. Wang, so is is this something? Is this something to do with Chinese gangs and underworld as well, or is this um, not no. directly in that case? But you see, there's there's the thin line there. I mean, obviously, the the founder of Huawei and uh, his daughter, who was arrested, uh, I doubt if that case is ever going to go anywhere. I mean, they really don't have that much on her. But the, the company like that obviously works with gangs. It, it's you know in the same way that someone like Stanley Ho, who just passed away, the the gambling boss of Macau, who was multi billionaire, he wasn't a gangster himself, but he worked very closely with the gangsters. It's part of their way they operate. You work with everyone. You work with government people. You work with gangsters. Um, 
you work with legitimate people. Um, anything that will increase your your reach and with the least amount of problems, because gangsters can call us problems, particularly if you run a casino, right? And my, uh, Ho ran a casino for like 40 or 50 years. He was a family. His family was from uh, a line of people that ran gambling and casinos going back almost 100, 200, 150 years. So, you know, they're, they're, they're rich Chinese business people, and Huawei is no different. That will work with criminal elements as need be. As we saw, mm-hmm. for instance, when there was a problem in Hong Kong, well, big problem last year, they used elements of the triads to beat up people in democracy. But not Huawei, but the government. Um, mm-hmm. Huawei yeah, would do it very diplomatically, whatever they did, but they're, it's, it's not black and white in China. It's all gray. Yeah. I, I, you know, I have to, it, it's, it's pretty... Um it's pretty, um, I don't know how you say this, it seems to be really quiet. A lot of people don't realize that there's um, such um, an underworld existing in Canada. It's always a surprise. Like when the money laundering happened and made the news, everyody's yeah. sort of shocked, as if, like, that doesn't happen here. Um, it does. Why do you, yeah, it does, but why do you think that is? Why? Why? Why are Canadians not noticing or not aware of it, or are they just denial or what do you think well everyone was asleep at the switch and uh, a lot of that money that came out and still being investigated royal commissions and this and that uh, came out uh, through casinos where it was pretty hard to detect uh, since gambling became super legal in Canada Uh, so these tens and hundreds of millions of dollars were just flowing through all these things and the DEA was on to it pretty early, but uh, they kind of watched it, you know. And and then uh, I'm not quite sure. I don't remember exactly what made it surface, but there were a few public events that made it surface. A few, uh, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but it seems to me there was some uh, overt criminal activity that appeared, um, and they suddenly realized what was going on. There was actually a senior Mountie, uh, RCMP officer, who figured it out in the money laundering department, and he he took it over. I think he's still in charge of of dealing with it because it's it's so massive. But it's not just Canada. I mean, it's through U.S. companies, and of course, in the United States, it would be mostly through private companies uh, that you wouldn't have access to necessarily. So, but you're right; it's kind of a sleeper issue. In fact, so much of a sleeper issue that Asian crime generally was. It's almost not looked at at all, you know, for the last 15 years, except for the odd killing and the odd, you know, we had a a guy ended up in cement in Toronto Harbor. He was a gambling guy. And the rivalries between the Vietnamese gangs and the odd killings and shootouts in Chinatown. But we didn't really have a feeling, and of course they were involved in, as marijuana became more and more available, and grow-offs, they were running most of the grow-offs in, uh, in Canada, uh, they would bring over Vietnamese women to sort of care the plants, and they would, uh, you know, sell the drugs in Canada into the United States. So there was a lot going on, but somehow it didn't get all put together by by anyone. You know, it hasn't been a RICO case in the United States against Asian crime in a while. It hasn't even been a big case in Canada against Asian crime, aside from the money laundering and the talk about the fentanyl. There hasn't been a big case. There have been drug cases, heroin cases, which connect to the same crime groups. There are also big circle boy gangs, mainland Chinese gangs. But it has been a sleeper issue, and part of its political correctness, you know, for a long time, particularly in Canada, we didn't want to identify it as Chinese or Vietnamese or even Asian. You know, when I started working on this in the early 80s, it was the Chinese unit. And we had a triad operating right here in Toronto, so they could hardly deny it, right? They were extorting students, and they were doing all sorts of incredible things here in Toronto and dealing with all the uh, gangs in in the United States. And then we had a lot of Vietnamese gangs here in Toronto and a gang war where 10 or 15 people were killed in in, uh, Chinatown in the 90s. So these things became 
very, very open and discussed. But then there was a reaction against that. The community, uh, kind of like uh, the Italian community, um, got together and said, no, this is anti-Asian, anti-Chinese. And so the police kept changing the names of the departments. And there was less and less focus in the media on it, and they just went undercover. And happily, you know, happily selling drugs, methamphetamine, <laughs> and marijuana, and grow ups, and fentanyl, and and making a lot, a lot of money in gambling. I didn't talk about gambling. Uh, yeah. We really hear, we re- rarely hear about it here in Vancouver anymore, which is odd. That's I guess. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is amazing because Vancouver was the heart of the gang wars of the 80s and 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, Asian thing was were just yeah. I mean, they I was each other it. anymore. It seemed like every every other day there was a uh, a retaliation murder from one side right. or the other, and and lately we don't hear about anything. I don't know if anything is just not going on, or maybe they've moved on to other things. I think that some of the gangs are still there that were fighting, uh, but the, the 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 UN gang is still around, but the. There's so many different groups now, not just Asian, uh, for one thing. And for the other thing, well, in Vancouver, the smart Asian gangsters have moved on. They moved on to uh, fentanyl, really making lots and lots of money. You know, a lot of the things that they were shooting each other about was not really much. It was bribery money. It was um, small-time uh, marijuana and methamphetamine. Uh, systems and they were they were having to fight with bikers and the Russian mob and the mafia too, where they cornered this whole fentanyl thing through, you know, making it legally in from China, mainland China, and they also cornered a lot of the money laundering thing back in two years ago, so that made it uh, it made it a lot easier. And for some reason, law enforcement didn't get onto it as we said earlier for a long time, which made it even much easier and then the names are very confusing for reporters and you know, I'm trying to sell stories over the years about Asian gangs people always said no the names are too complicated you have too many hoes and you know uh, people can be very simplistic sometimes you know yeah. Um, yeah. and trends and, but the thing is the names are actually very colorful and you know this goes back talk about colorful you know when they were when the Chinese gangs were really covered was back at the turn of the 19th century and, and the 20th century rather and the um, and the uh, wars between the hatchet uh, the hatchet men uh, there were incredible tong wars between 1900 and 1920s in Vancouver and San Francisco and New York even in Toronto where the hatchet men would you know uh, go around intimidating and killing people, and they had to bring in the uh, the uh, ambassador from China and a judge to sort it all out. After many years, it was pretty sensational. You know, one Tong boss wrote his memoirs back in 1930. It was very popular. Um, and these Tongs were very powerful groups. They were mostly groups of family groups within New York and other places, but they had criminal activities included you know it's rather complicated why these criminal activities came that way because it really is because when the Chinese came to North America there was a lot of prejudice and uh, a lot of bigotry against them so they weren't allowed to bring their women they weren't allowed to stay very long they came for the railroad or the gold mines and basically they had to bring in their own for the men they had working on the railroads and the gold mines they had to bring in their own uh, women so they brought in prostitutes. They had to bring in their own drugs, opium, and make their own drugs, and get and activities gambling. So all those things were almost, you know, made made possible by the way the bigotry was. So we had all those things that developed uh, in the early part of the 20th century uh, in in West Coast and in the East Coast, certainly in New York, and the subsequent Tong Wars. So it's just a long, colorful history to all of this. I have a lot of this in a book I wrote called uh, Dragons of Crime, which is I just reissued on a uh, on Amazon.com as an ebook. Asian mobs in Canada. There haven't been many books on that subject at all. 
Hmm. You know, it's I wonder amazing. why. Is it, do you think it's just because there's it, people don't feel threatened by it? That's part of it. You're right. People don't. They feel much more threatened by the mafia, uh, by bikers. Uh, you're right. And street gangs, obviously, uh, certainly in Canada, and I'm sure I know in the States, street gangs are um, yeah, yeah. black youths, Somali youths, Haitian youths in Montreal. They're much more threatening because they, well, they're much more visible, you know. Yeah. Well, today. I think people, well, with these gangs, the Asian gangs, they tend to. Uh, focus on each other. They tend to kill each other a lot more than coming out. And uh, you very seldom hear about someone being killed by accident or involved in this. So that has well, nothing happened. to do with it's the happened. games. It's it happened happens. in New York. Yeah. It's happened in Seattle. I think it certainly happened in San Francisco. Seattle. You know, when they had back in the nineties, it yeah. was a mass killing at a gambling house in Seattle, I believe. And there was one in. Yeah, uh, do you remember that? I don't. When, when, but, uh, yeah, well, the gambling houses were run by the triads, and there was battles with Vietnamese gangs, and there was a lot of murder. But that's why I say, back in the early '90s, mid '90s, it was much more common to see coverage of it. And the other problem is the names are so complicated. It's not like Al Capone or John Gotti, right? right. We're talking about Lao Wing Koi, which is pronounced differently yeah. than it's spelled, K U I. Uh, you're talking about names that people don't relate to, and that's a problem too. So there's a lot of cultural reasons for that, um, and the fact that there haven't been heroes made out of any of the criminals, you know, as, as the same way they have with the Italian mafia, or even bikers with Sons of Anarchy, say, uh, yeah. there haven't been the same level at all with Chinese uh, gangsters. I mean, Eddie Chan was one, Nicky Louie in New York, but they come and go so fast that they don't get known by the public at all, and so they just pass through the system for those vaguely yeah. exotic names. Well, well you, you, all you of would think you, you'd be able to write something about, um, you know, because a lot of the stories like Al Capone and, and all those, um, there's been a lot of movies and stories presented, right? So oh. I, I just, well, yeah, I just wonder why they couldn't do it with some of these Asian gang. Leaders. Well, they did. They did in the 20s, well, 30s, and they did, uh, again, a little bit in the 90s, not a lot. Uh, but right now, you're right, there hasn't been much. I mean, there's one famous movie, mm, well, all the Chan movies, but uh, The Year of the Dragon. Did yeah. you see that movie? No, That was about the triads, and, uh, and, and they were connected in the movie with New York. And I saw it in Toronto, when they mentioned the man in Toronto, in the movie in Toronto, when Roads, you know, uh, but it was you know Hong Kong, China, uh, New York, Toronto, San Francisco. Uh, it was the Year of the Dragon. Uh, Mickey O'Rourke, very fine movie, very sensational. It just for some reason uh, it hasn't been gone into by the by the sensational movies or even the whole true crime genre, which is so popular right now, and documentaries. You see very little about Asian crime. You know, I'm working on two different ones right now, actually three. Uh, two of them are on serial killers. For some reason, the true crime documentaries love serial killers cases. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a company called Oxygen, do you know it? And, oh, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've, I've been on one of their shows, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I did, yeah, I did, yeah. I'm, I'm, go, I'm about to be, I, don't, I think it's on in August, about a, that, that like exotic murders and there's one that didn't even get any attention in Toronto a gay murder a guy had his husband murdered through a hit person anyway who was a lover and they're doing a full hour on it in oxygen and they're doing the serial killing of course which I've done other things on uh, yeah. MacArthur the guy who slaughtered eight people here in Toronto in the last couple of years a uh, long complicated story the police were totally screwed oh. it up for a long time so they're doing that, but I don't know how sensational they are or whether they... And the other thing they tend to do is recreate things, and I'm a little worried about that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it, yeah. It's some Dramatic of them. recreation. They tell me they're not going to, but we'll see. Yeah, they become very fictionalized, and uh, and that dramatic recreation creates the story in people's minds, and they believe that's what's happened. 
Yeah, and even the CBC, which is hardly, you know, the Canadian Broadcasting Company is hardly a uh, sensational American media outlet, but even they do that. Just recently I saw a program about the, the, the police officer in the case called The Detectives. It was, it was also about the serial killer, but they had an actor playing Hank and Signia, the cop, and it lost all credibility in my mind, having an actor speaking the words, and they had one of the victims, you know, tied down on the bed, which also lost all credibility because it was recreated. They had an actor playing the cop, but they also had the real cop in the show, so it was very confusing from a uh, from a storyline point of view, to say the least. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the CBC that's doing that. That's the public broadcaster. Well, they're all trying to get in on the uh, uh, the popularity of it all, I guess. And exactly. and you know, when I did that show, I, it was the same thing. Um, they they only want the real um, salacious and and right. wild parts, and you know, they want to keep people uh, tuned in, I guess. Sure. Well, that's understandable. I mean, you can do it responsibly, and and particularly in the in the serial killing case here, the the most recent one. I mean, the cops. Were, you know, had gone down tunnel vision uh, about a cannibalism ring for three, two years and then left everything for four years while more people were killed. So there's lots of responsible journalism that has to be done there. So I'm hoping they're not going to avoid that. But it's hard to say. I did a show here in Toronto and it hasn't come out yet. And they weren't focusing on the police. because I, I helped get the police, the lead police investigator, but they will bring it up for sure because it's part of the story. But until I see it, I'm just not sure because it's such a sensational story. You, you've dealt with serial killers, you know how sensational yeah, it can be. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that aspect, I admit. And the police are often way behind them. That's why they're successful serial killers. They get away for it for so long. You wouldn't see much of a serial killer if you got caught right away. Yeah. And that yeah, makes yeah. it real challenging for the cops. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, the whole thing. Uh, it, 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 Canadian crime, but is different than the American crime, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And even the reporting of it. Um, um, so it, it, it has a different feel to it, I think. Usually, yeah. But, but you, you should have seen the coverage uh, a couple of years ago as the bodies were being discovered. It was over a period of a, a year, once the police really got into their investigation. They were discovering bodies and planters, and it was so sensational, and yet the media here went right along with it. Overnight, we became the American media. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. incredible. <laughs> it was staking out for, you know, trying, watching cops looking for bones in backyards yeah, and all this stuff. It was pretty bad. They're still looking well, at McCarth for murders, uh, the... Uh Murders from the village in uh, the seventies, I believe, or the eighties. Yes, but it, yes, I know about that because yeah, I did a lot of work on that uh, uh, during the whole period, and I was living in Toronto in the seventies. I remember those murders; we were all terrified. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were murdered as cops coming to one of the major bars, but uh, believe me when I say there's very little evidence to tie him to anything in the seventies. Mm -hmm. Um. He was married then. He didn't seem to be killing people. He, he didn't really start until around 2000 when he uh, attacked a, a fellow in the gay village. But they are looking, and it's always possible. Um, but eight murders is, is pretty pretty damn impressive, and there are another four that he almost killed, so that's 12. Actually, there's another one, 13. Uh, for any serial killer, that's a lot. And mm. got away with it for so many years. It was only in 17 he was arrested, so he got away with it for over 15 years. Oh, and, and he was... He, now, so he was eating uh, the the people he killed, or...? No. What was... No. That's, no. that's Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> yeah. So so what was what was the MacArthur's uh, motive, do you think? Or what, oh, what do you think he was doing? Oh, his motive very complex. Um... But what he actually did was he, he um, ensnared mostly uh, recent immigrants from Asia, uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, from Iraq, Iran, Iran was one of them. Anyway, from 
uh, recent immigrants who were slightly vulnerable, not that much younger, but in the 20s and 30s. He was older. Now, MacArthur was 67 when he was arrested, so he was one of the oldest serial killers ever. Uh, there was a sexual motive for sure, but a lot of it was he had relationships with them before he killed them. I mean, the first murder was someone he had, had working for him. He ran a landscaping company, and he was working for him, and he had a, relation, a sexual and social relationship with him for years uh, before he killed him and put him in a planter and then kept him on his Facebook page for another 10 years. He didn't have that many friends on Facebook. The cops should have been able to find that because the guy had been missing all that time. Uh, you know, he, he, he and he kept he kept things that he, you know, just like most serial killers, he kept things in relation to their bodies and corpses, and he kept the bones very close. He had a place where he stored all the bones and all the uh, the bodies, and they were never found, so that was a, 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 a clever technique. But in terms of why he killed them, I think it has a very complicated having to do with how he dealt with his own homosexuality and the thrill he got. He was into a bit of S&M sex, but that wasn't the cause of it either. Often, though, a lot of these people, and certainly the ones that got away, were into some hot S&M thing where he just went too far, and they realized that he might kill them. Well, they didn't go to the police. And, and of course, drugs were involved sometimes, too. Uh, it was pretty... Uh, it was almost totally sexual, uh, why, why, he, why he did it. It was part of that crazy killer thing that they can be part of you, not by eating them, but by killing them, you know, by total control. I don't know if you ever spoke to a, a serial killing exit like Peter Vronsky, but they can explain it better than I can. But uh, it's, it's, it's fairly complicated, the motives. It's about control. It's about identity. And uh, it's about a lot of serious psych psychological issues. Obviously, I saw MacArthur in court. He was a broken man. He had no control. Uh, he said nothing, absolutely nothing, even mm -hmm. as he pled guilty to eight, eight homicides. Wow. Yeah, Peter and I wrote a book together. I just talked to him yesterday, so, yeah. Oh, well, you know who I'm I know him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's quite yeah. a character. He's a, yeah, he's a, he's a guy. <laughs> yeah. I like him. like him a lot. Oh, um, he's very good. Yeah, I, I knew him before he got into serial killing as a specialty, but... Did I say serial yeah. killing is a specialty? I guess. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> That's quite the job. Exposing serial killing is a specialty. Yeah. And he does it well. Yeah. He does it very well. He explains it well. Uh, I saw him in a documentary by the film, the film company I was working with last year and another film, and it was about the Unabomber. And he really explained it so well in just a sentence or two. He's used a lot in it. It's the Unabomber one where, I don't know if you saw it, I think it was on yeah, Netflix yeah. in the States, but uh, where they have an, uh, an audio interview with him yeah. uh, in jail. Anyway, right, Bronski right. throughout that, and he's excellent in that. just has these very good points to make, and usually in a sentence, that you can understand in, in English. Yeah. There's a lot of serial yeah. killing experts, criminologists who don't speak in English. Yeah, it's too, it's too far uh, removed. People don't understand it. Yeah, yeah and they're... Yeah. And they're to be fair, they're they're criminal they're criminologists and they're you know yeah. PhDs in in in, uh, in specialties and they and they, they try to narrow it down. But but what Peter does is he tries to make it more accessible, so to say. Yeah, which is yeah. really he's important, good. I think. Yeah, he's a good way to get across to people. Um, now now uh, the other thing too, you're covering a lot of mob mafia. Uh, that's yeah. another thing. I, I think in general people think that the mafia is done. It's sort of past. It's it's kind of over its heyday. Um, it, it, that's not really true, is it? Well, it's over its heyday, certainly. Uh, it's a totally different thing now in 2020 than it was uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, before Rudy Giuliani and all the rest went after all the people in the States people here, but we still have a lot of mafias. It isn't one mafia. There's an Italian mafia. There's very big in Canada is what we call the Andrangheta, what they call the Andrangheta, which is the Calabrian uh, mafia, which is extremely big in Italy. The Italian police have been going after them the last 20 years. is 
one of the largest mafias in Italy is the Andrangheta. And, of course, Sicilian mafia is still around, but it's not nearly as powerful. The families in the United States not nearly as powerful. Um, the one in Buffalo is just starting to re restart itself. It's been, it's been very weak the last few years. The five families in New York have been pretty weak the last few years, not like the 60s and 70s when Banana was around and Galenti, you know, these legendary figures, or even John Gotti in the 80s. Um, so the mob is still there, and in Italy, of course, they're they're involved right now in pandemic scams, if you can believe it. Um, <laughs> naturally, the Sicilian and the Calabrian, and of course the uh, Naples, the Camorra. So I would say there are more more mob families now, uh, not as powerful, not as singularly powerful as they were back in the past, but certainly all around. And certainly in the United States too, but not as noticeable. Sorry. I was just gonna say what is it that they do now um that's so different? Like what, what kind of things are they um are they focusing on? Well, they do everything. I mean they're very much in the fentanyl trade. One of the last convictions we had here of a major mob family and Drangheta and uh, all of the five families and in New York, involved with the Andrangheta here in Ontario and in upstate New York, was was involved in fentanyl. So they were doing fentanyl uh, importation with Chinese, actually, with the uh, triads. They're not stupid, you know. But then a lot of the mob families are still doing what they always did, gambling. Um, we still have... Uh, a lot of uh, illegal gambling, uh, particularly on off offshore gambling machines and things that the, the mob controls. Uh, union, union stuff, not as much as they used to be, of course. Uh, drugs, big time, other than fentanyl, they're still involved in, uh, you know, the various heroin and uh, methamphetamine, all that sort of stuff. Marijuana, of course. Uh, so they're still involved in all the everyday things, but. Uh, and of course, murder and all the other things that come by, uh, come by of being a gangster. But they pretty much keep up to date with, uh, we've had a lot of murders in Quebec and Ontario in the last few years, basically because there's been fighting among the various groups in the dominant mafia family, which was run by a guy named Rizzuto, and he died about six or seven years ago, and there had been a lot of problems when he was in jail in the States for a while. You know, if you remember Rizzuto, he was went to jail for some killings of Banana family lieutenants many years earlier. Anyway, it created a lot of um, instability in the mobs here in, in Canada, and it's still still existing. We still have people fighting it out to the death. We uh, Every six months or so, we have another body of a... Andrangheta or a Rizzuto family associate found dead. So it goes on. I haven't been following it as closely in New York and in the States as recently, but there have been the odd thing. But they're nowhere near as dominant as they once were. You're quite right there. Pro probably because of all the other groups, you know, as we talked about the mainland Chinese gangs, the Vietnamese gangs, the Russian gangs, the uh, Russian mobs. The bikers all over the place, particularly Hell's Angels in Canada. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of different criminal groups. So it's not easy for the Italian mob to dominate as, as they used to. Now, are, are these groups, a lot of them, into the human trafficking? Is that sort of a big, um, a big thing for these gangs? Yes, it always has been, too. You know, going, you go back to the Mafia 150 years ago, they were doing human trafficking. Uh, you go back to Asian crime 150 years ago, they were doing human trafficking. In those days, they were bringing young girls into San Francisco by the crate to provide the men with women. Uh, and they went up to ship them up to Vancouver. That was 150 years ago. Um, so the trafficking continues because it's something they can control, particularly with the Chinese government. For many years, people wanted to, a lot of people wanted to get out of China. And the uh, snakeheads is what they're called within the Chinese criminal underworld. Snakeheads provided outlets. Usually they were very well connected with the 
mainland Chinese bureaucracy, the generals, the military, and they would get the people out from various places in Fukian province and other in Canton area, get them through Hong Kong, and take them on these very long routes through Europe and South America, Canada it used to be, uh, and, and to a new life in New York City or Toronto or Vancouver, where they would start, you know, working, you know, uh, not as legal, uh, re- legal residents, but uh, but they would start working, and the gangs had more people when they brought them over. So there was, so there's been a long, long history of human trafficking, and of course the women were often used for um, some of the uh, massage parlors, which we still have quite a few of in Toronto. Uh, I believe you have some in the United States too. Oh yeah, jeez. <laughs> yeah, and they, they, and they, they appear quite innocent, you know. But some of the girls in those places, in the Asian-run, Chinese-run massage parlors, are usually kind of indentured. You know, we talk about slavery being such a horrible thing that it was in the 19th century, but we've had indentured slavery throughout the 20th century uh, of of peoples. Uh, and you see that within the Asian crime community. It's a way of paying, see, because it can be from thirty to fifty thousand dollars to get out of a little village in the Fukian province. So you've got to pay it back to the snakehead. So part of that, you work for a few years in a uh, in a massage parlor. If you're a woman, if you're a guy, you you do some jobs for them. You know, uh, whether it's kidnapping people or running a you know, a pot, pot establishment or running drugs across the border. A lot of speed goes both ways uh, between the United States and Canada, even with the border and even with all the walls that Mr. Trump has put up <laughs> down in <Yeah>. Mexico. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and none of the... Now, now, the Hells Angels, what are their connection with the mobs nowadays, or what do they oh, do gosh. for the mob, or how do they wor- work with them? Like, what's, what's, the pri- what's the priorities? Well, in Canada, the Hells Angels have, in the last 20 years, become supreme. They're the major biker gangs throughout the whole country, from British Columbia to the Maritimes, certainly in Ontario and Quebec. It was a biker war going back 20 years ago between several biker gangs, uh, the Outlaws, uh, Rock Machine, but the Hells Angels became supreme. So they and their, uh, their striker clubs are the ones that run everything. They work very closely with the Mafia, and street gangs in Montreal. There have been cases uh, where the three of them get together, the Hells Angels leadership, the Mafia leadership, which is weakened, as we said, not as dominant, still members of the Rizzuto family and their colleagues, and members of the street gangs, which in Montreal are Haitian primarily, uh, get together and sort out various things. They carve things up, drug territory, a whole bunch of things. And there have been murders involving all three groups. Sometimes the Mafia would use Hells Angels hitmen. Sometimes the, the, the Mafia would use street gang Haitian hitmen. And uh, funnily enough, the Hells Angels use their own people, <laughs> pretty much. They don't usually go outside of their group for killing people. Um, but the Hells Angels are pretty dominant in, in drugs uh, in a lot of areas in Canada. Uh, which, of course, means the United States, too, because the border doesn't mean a lot when you're dealing with organized crime. There's so many ways around the main border. Um, so the, the Hells Angels are involved in everything from fentanyl to methamphetamine, all the drugs you can think of, trafficking in women, of course, uh, gambling, just so many different activities, extortion, of course, still... Um, there's just so many and they're pretty powerful in Canada now in the United States it varies from state to state and area to area I would say Quebec and Ontario are the two most powerful areas for the Hells Angels in Canada and there haven't been too many good cases here in Ontario lately um, the Toronto Hells Angels they, they also involve legitimate business they own bars uh, they're in pot businesses now we, you know pot is legal throughout all of Canada so some of those businesses are run for and by the Hells Angels. And it's very hard mm. to get at that. The police 
work in it. They still have special units and all that. So I'd say the Hells Angels, there are three really dominant international groups in North America, and I would say the uh, Hells are the bikers, the Asian gangs, which includes the, uh, the Big Circle Boys and the Vietnamese gangs and the Fukunese gangs, and some of the uh, Russian mobs, I guess, but the bikers would be the third one. And there are other groups as well, but it's amazing. I started out working in organized crimes, I think I told you earlier in the interview, in a series for the CBC in 1974, early 74, and I never would have thought 45, 46 years ago that, I, that, there, would, that there would still be so much organized crime and that I would still be working in that area at all. It's gotten far worse than it was in the 70s and 80s and in terms of overall organized crime activity. Quite amazes me now that I'm 74, and there's just so many organized crime groups in Toronto and Montreal yeah. and throughout the states, throughout the world. You know, I'm sure you've read McMafia. I mean, that all the Slavic and Russian groups that came out of the demise of the Soviet Union. It's incredible. Incredible. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, what, what, so, what do you plan on doing now? Like, where where do you go from here? Are you going to continue doing these these types of books and research? Well, I'm not doing books at the moment. I'm, I might do one on the MacArthur case if this one that's supposed to be coming out doesn't come out in delayed for some reason. Um, but I think only because not so much about the sensationalism at all, which is there, but a lot of that came out during a, sort of an aborted trial. But because of the police ineptness. Uh, in dealing with a lot of this, and that I, I do want to expose. Um, I've been working um, in a lot of different areas, uh, you know, documentaries, that sort of thing, helping out. I'm kind of, in a way, semi-retired because I'm working as a uh, advisor, consultant, whatever you will, for these film companies mostly. Don't have much radio in my life, although I do have radio when it comes to ongoing crimes. I'm also a spokesman. I mean, i not a spokesman. I'm a commentator in Canadian media when various organized crime things come up, which a couple of weeks ago there was something, you know, a shooting, a killing, a, uh, an arrest, and, and so they put me on the CBC or the CTV news or the radio. But radio, yes, uh, we have one wonderful radio station in Canada still, it's, uh, well, we have several, but the CBC, uh, in its wisdom, has a great show every morning called uh, Metro Morning, if you've ever heard of it, and they've been covering everything from crime to, you know, organized crime to the serial killer very thoroughly, because they, that's the one thing about radio, you have all this time, you know, I mean, Metro Morning has several hours every morning, just for Toronto. Metro being Toronto, right? Yeah. They have several hours to deal yeah. with what's happening in Toronto. So they have, whereas the TV news usually has a few minutes and it, it's much more superficial. Yeah. So, so radio still has its place. And I, and I do, I do some, I do quite a bit of radio. I did some really recently. And these days I don't even ask for money anymore as a consultant. So. <laughs> I was able to invest. Do you have a website? Sorry. Yeah, I do have a website. Oh, I was going to say, do you have... with the Crime Writers of Canada page. Uh, I, I, I used to be president and chairman of the Crime Writers of Canada, which is a, mostly a group, a professional group of uh, um, mystery writers, detective story writers, and true crime writers. It's been around for about 30 years, at least 35 years. And I used to be in charge of the awards committee. We just had our awards. And some fabulous writers are in there. So I have a web page. I'm in there. Are you in there? There you are. So you can look me right up there. Yeah. I'm going to actually do a web page this year with a friend of mine who's uh, kind of a specialist in that. But I haven't uh, haven't done my own web page. I just have been using the primary so anyone can find me that way. A lot of people, you know, who have been burned or hurt by organized crime, they have to find me, and they usually find me through the crime writers' page. I call them walk-ins. You had walk-ins? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's how I do it. And, of course, I, I uh, for a friend of mine, I, I worked uh, doing these e-books of three of my more popular books over the years, uh, one called Mob Rule, 
and one called Mob Mistress, and the third one, Dragons of Crime, which we talked about. They're all available through the Amazon page and a few other digital websites. I'm not very proficient in all that, but they're very inexpensive, you know, and it's something like $7 or $8. They're not very expensive. Um, mm. To pick up that well, way. We'll have all that up. We'll put that up on our oh, website. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that. can just uh, find you real easy, and uh, and uh, any mob looking for you, we'll, we'll help them out. Um, <laughs> I don't think they'd have too much trouble finding me. <laughs> we have one gangster that won't die here lately. His name is Pat Lusitano. They tried to kill him about ten different ways in the last few years. He's been after me, but he barely escapes. Wow. Last time he got shot four times and he got out without half a face gone. <laughs> that was exciting. Life. Yeah. You know, when you say, back just just before we go, you say police ineptness for the MacArthur case. Um, now, do you think that's because it's gay-related? Is it is it that kind of an issue in in Canada, or is that not an issue? Well, it's part of the issue. It's very, like most things, it's very complicated, but uh, part of it right. is they just don't know a lot about the gay world. Two, they didn't go to the right people. And three, they got into, I mean, they did seriously want to try to solve the first few cases, three of them there were, uh, but they got into uh, tunnel vision. They got into some leads that turned out to be bad about a cannibalism ring. It's a long, complicated story, but they spent a year and a half on that. It didn't pan out. They arrested the guy for um, kitty pawn eventually. It was a faux cannibalism ring. There were real cannibalism rings if, mm. in Europe, but this was not a real one. But as a result of that, oh, okay. uh, they lost four years until from 2013 to 2017 while the serial killer was killing four or five people. Uh, they lost it. They weren't even investigating. And they didn't come back to it until at that point there were quite a few people missing, obvious people missing in 17. And they went back and it only took them a few months to solve it then. But they had left it for four years, which allowed the killer to kill a lot. And that partly was that they just weren't familiar with the gay world. Like there were no gay officers on that on that squad. Uh, I know the chief investigator. He's not the least bit anti-gay, but he just didn't have good sources, you know. And uh, and they weren't getting the right information either, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of the people that were victims who were almost murdered didn't come forward. So it gets to be a very complicated story. Um, okay, yeah. Well, maybe when you do that book, if you do it, and um, we'll have you back on. Oh, well, thank you very we'll much. Talk Appreciate about it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, our guest again has been James Debro. Thank you very much for being on the thank show. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www houseofmystery.com show is over for now was it as good for you as it was for me well good night this has been a production of something weird media i'll be back